So Trigo has introduced uh, just now um, what the Institute has been doing for really a long time, which is looking at expression of genes uh, throughout the brain, uh, mouse, human, um, but usually either with um, high resolution in terms of the genes that can be that can be analyzed, but the spatial resolution wasn't cell uh, single cell resolution, or looking at the single cell resolution, like what Jane introduced with the mouse brain atlas, uh, but not being able to look at multiple genes at a time. So what I'm going to talk about is trying to look at all the genes in individual cells, um, mostly in mice, but I will also mention in humans. And the, 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 the biggest use uh, that I'm going to introduce is for classification, for single cell classification. So, um, as you all know, um, or I think as you all probably agree, that in order to describe any system, we need to understand what are the building blocks of the system. And um, usually uh, we call these flavors of building blocks types or classes, and I'm just going to refer to them as cell types uh, throughout the talk. So uh, people have tried, and many people are still working on this. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important topic of understanding uh, uh, any, any nervous system, in fact, any probably multicellular system is to understand what are the building blocks, what are the, the flavors of building blocks, and we can do that, we can classify these, uh, these groups of cells based on different types of characteristics. We can use, for neurons specifically, we can use electrophysiology, morphology, transcriptomics, or transcriptional signatures and function. I'm just using the most commonly used ones. Um, and um, to the, um, Costas will talk probably more about the electrophysiology and morphology, uh, and I'll touch briefly upon that. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about transcriptomics, but ultimately, uh, what we do want to do is um, acquire more than one data type from a single cell to get better classification, to get more accurate classification, and to also establish correspondence between these different types of characteristics. Um, this is not going to be a single study where we will uh, clarify everything in uh, doing it once. It's going to be an iterative approach that's going to be improved as our techniques improved, as our understanding um, uh, is informed by previous studies and therefore we can define uh, better approaches um, for further cell classification and characterization. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to um, give you a, uh, an overview of what we have recently published on single cell transcriptomics in mouse visual system, and I will give you uh, some glimpses into subsequent iterations that are in progress. Um, so, as I said, the, the major, the major um, goal of our cell types program uh, at the Institute is to take cells um, from the brain uh, usually from very well-defined anatomical regions and using some characteristics, and in this particular uh, talk I'm going to mostly talk about transcriptomics, uh, define groups of related cells and also define uh, relatedness and hierarchy uh, of relatedness between these groups. Um, our main approach has so far been to take transgenic mice that we have uh, generated or we have acquired from uh, the community um, to go into well anatomically defined locations. We are focusing on the primary visual uh, system for this study and for um, subsequent studies we will also be refining this taxonomy as we expand to other regions. We sort these cells using fluorescence activated cell sorting and then um, what we do is each cell's uh, RNA is being reverse transcribed, amplified uh, into cDNA, and then sequenced by next generation sequencing. Um, um, the data um, analysis um, in this field, I would say, is really nowhere close to a consensus. There are really no clear standards in multiple different uh, labs approach these problems uh, with different tools, but all kind of with the same uh, uh, 
goal in mind, which is to group these cells eventually uh, using their gene expression signatures. Um, I, I won't really go into details here, but just want to mention that we take all the genes and all the cells, and then we define genes that show um, variance higher than technical noise, and we have, there are different ways to estimate this technical noise, and then we perform clustering. In this particular case, we performed iterative principal component analysis and um, WGCNA weighted gene co-expression network analysis uh, with, so we performed that dimensionality reduction and clustering and ultimately um, after actually cluster validation which involved a, a, a machine learning uh, random forest approach we ended up with 49 clusters uh, from a data set that included a, a close to 1700 cells and uh, this last part of the approach, which was uh, this random forest approach that allows cells to have one or another identity and it, it is done iteratively so that you can actually count how frequently a cell is assigned to a certain identity. It provided a landscape, a transcriptional, uh, transcriptionally informed landscape of cell types that has core cells, which are cells that always uh, are classified into a, a single type, and some cells that are kind of more ambiguously classified. So we call them core cells and transitional cells. And it's important that I introduce this because uh, that will be used later to, uh, to represent these, uh, these cell types and their relationships. Um, I just want to show you here briefly without going into details that um, this data set um, ultimately defined 23 GABAergic types, 19 glutamatergic and 7 non neuronal types. This is just based on the major uh, marker genes. Um, and then what we use is we use these so-called constellation diagrams to represent these cell types, um, also with roughly placing them um, uh, based on um, enrichment uh, by isolation or the genes that they express into certain layers or at least upper versus lower uh, part of the cortex. And the key to take out of this is that each one of these disks is proportional to the number of cells that uh, belong to that type. The lines, the thickness of the lines is proportional to uh, the number of intermediate cells, these cells with uh, ambiguous identity. And um, what we see is in very much in agreement with the uh, previous literature, but we also discover new types and subtypes. So for example, for inhibitory neuron types, we have VIP, so we have statin and parvalbumin major groups. And then we have these non VIP SST or parval viewing groups, which we group into NDNF. This is a neuropeptide that um, labels a couple of groups. And then we also have some other um, not very um, frequently present in the cortex uh, groups. Um, we have a very similar um, uh, representation for the excitatory types, and we define uh, types that are in agreement with, again, what has previously been shown in the literature based on um, uh, very specific genes. So each one of these tags is a little kind of uh, a periodic table-like identity of, uh, of, uh, of each uh, cell type. Um, uh, again, uh, what we see is not only cells, cell types that uh, segregate based on the layer they come from, but also within the layer we find subtypes, and for example, uh, they nicely segregate uh, based on the projection patterns. We have some additional experiments uh, in the paper to show that. Um, um, and of course, Terry will go maybe a bit more into details about this, but this is part of, uh, this data set is currently part of the science vignettes. These are, uh, before we actually go full speed into a pipeline mode, some of these projects have been kind of uh, preliminary projects. I know this is a large scale preliminary <laughs> project for academic labs, but it's still a, a preliminary project because we are now expanding to other areas. Um, so it's present as um, our website as Science Vignette, and eventually we would like it to become part of a uh, cell text database. Um, and already uh, lateral genital nucleus data is part of the cell text database in our new data set that will be uh, including this, not this particular uh, um, primary visual cortex, but additional data that we're generating with a new and better chemistry and additional cortical areas will be released as part of the cell types database. So if we acquire only a single data type, 
we can um, uh, we can um, understand. Uh, we can describe where these cells, or determine where these cells are in this transcriptomically defined multidimensional space. But we, we don't know how these groups of cells, how these clusters, relate to, let's say, cells that were, uh, that were clustered based on galactic physiological um, characteristics. And we would really like to establish the correspondence. So that's where this integrated neural phenotyping comes in. Uh, so of course, the, 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 the most obvious approach is to collect the two types of data from the same cell and then do that over and over and over again. And then eventually, uh, if one does this uh, sufficient number of times uh, with sufficient sampling, you can, um, you can derive these uh, correspondences. Um, there are other approaches which I won't discuss, but this is one of the main approaches we are pursuing. And um, we're using PatchSeq to do this. So you patch as if you were to do electrophysiological recording, and in fact you do electrophysiological recording, but you don't do only that. You, after you, are, you have completed your electrophysiological examination, you extract the content, you collect this content into a tube, and then you obtain a transcriptomic signature. And um, this would be really powerful um, to connect electrophysiology and transcriptomics, but it may actually also allow us to include morphology as well if we can preserve it. And we have some preliminary data that in a small subset of cases this may be possible. And just want to mention, there, these are, uh, the approach is not entirely new, but it has been really uh, perfected uh, by the two groups uh, recently. And we have, we have applied some of the, some of the wisdom from their uh, approaches to get this working in-house. And I just won't go too much into detail, but basically, after performing standard electrophysiological recording, you extract the content, and then you, if the morphology is still intact, you can uh, uh, stain for morphology and visualize it, and you can also obtain transcriptome. And uh, it's really important, at least for us, we would like to be able to relate our transcriptomic data to this, our single cell transcriptomic data that was obtained from PAC cells. So uh, we try to compare and we try to use the knowledge gained based on these FACS benchmark data set to classify these patch seq cells. And we do this by um, basically de defining transcriptomic data set based on FACS and oh. then we actually do, uh, we map this patch seq sample, its, its um, gene expression pattern to uh, gene expression patterns of um, defined transcriptomic clusters. And um, there are different ways one can do it. Initially we we're doing it, you can talk to Vilas a bit more uh, on how this is done. This is mostly his work, but currently we are again using the random force classifier to classify these patch seq cells back into our transcriptomic data set. And I just want to mention that we have some very encouraging preliminary data that define cells from defined pre lines. Um, I think I'm going a bit too much over time. In fact, map correctly based on the cells they come from. So for example, if we collect cells from VIP chat, which we know it's a, it's a, a chat iris cree, which is uh, labels VIP chat type, we actually see that based on the gene expression pattern, these cells map correctly to a particular transcriptomic type. So this is the Cree line and this is the type. While if we do it from a VIP iris Cree, which labels multiple different VIP types, we get multiple VIP subtypes. Um, and just want to mention that it's really exciting. We also have a very large, um, or expanding, I should say, uh, human cell type program that Trey is part of. And they're trying to apply all the experimental techniques. I shouldn't say all, because some are not possible, like genetic <laughs> techniques, but many uh, mouse, uh, many techniques that we establish in mouse to human. And for example, this patch seek, we're trying to apply it to human neurosurgical tissues. We collaborate with um, a network of, of surgeons uh, in um, Seattle, and we receive fresh tissue from them, and then the same examination, same patch seek examination can be performed on human, primary human tissue. And actually, the efficiency may be even better than uh, in mice. And with that, I think I'm quite over my time, I just want to say, again, this is a really not large number of people that, have, that are participating in this. This is me, this is Took, 
who collaborated uh, with Vilas on the transcriptomic paper. Vilas, where are you? I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is Tim Dolbert who made, for example, the vignette that you can see um, online. Um, and I probably can't find many of the other people, but um, Vilas uh, was a main data analyst for, uh, for the transcriptomic data. Anyway, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.